This conference will now be recorded. Hello everyone, I am Dr. Juma Vishwas, one of the mentor of MRCUG Health. Today I'm going to discuss about one of the important topic of a recent talk, 2022 January, that is the investigation and management of postcoital bleeding. So I think uh, those we are dealing with the gynae OPT, that's outpatient department, uh, most of the cases we see the post uh, postcoital bleeding. So firstly, I will discuss about what is uh, postcoital bleeding, what are the incidents of that, what are the causes related to that, and how we're going to manage this case. Um, it's based on this talk. So postcoital bleeding is defined as non-menstrual bleeding or spotting occurring immediately after sexual intercourse. Overall incidence is about 0.7 to 9 percent, uh, and six percent occurs in premenopausal women. So those who present in a primary care with a postcoital bleeding is found that one in 44,000 women is aged between 20 to 24, and one in 2,400 women ages between 45 to 55 will have the cervical cancer. So you can see that in young age, postcoital bleeding is not that much uh, uh, problematic, but for 45 to 54 years, if any woman present with postcoital bleeding, you have to evaluate for cervical cancer most carefully and importantly. So when a patient come to you with a postcoital bleeding, in that situations, uh, postcoital bleeding, uh, you have to think about that mostly it arises typically with the contact with the lesions on the cervix, vagina, on the vulva. And sometimes it can be uh, caused because of any kind of endometrial pathology like any polyp or any kind of uh, endometrial cancer or hyperplasia. If it is like that, then it is also associated with intermenstrual or heavy menstrual bleeding. So these are the commonest cause of postcoital bleeding. So you can see it's broadly divided into benign condition, infection, vulval, malignancy, and others. So in the benign condition, so it can be erogenital atrophy in the postmenopausal woman. The most commonest problem of the postcoital bleeding is the atrophy. Benign vascular tumor of the genital tract, uh, for an example, hemangioma or AV malformation. Cervical or any endometrial polyp, this is also one of the commonest cause of postcoital bleeding. Cervical ectropion, if any patient's taking any oral contraceptive pill, especially in the reproductive woman, they have a higher risk of that. Cervical endometriosis, though these are very rare, but it can also cause postcoital bleeding. Infection, mostly it's common for the reproductive age woman, like one of the causes vulvovaginitis, secondary to candidiasis or trachomoniasis. Cervicitis, um, if it is secondary to chlamydia on the gonorrhea. So in the reproductive age woman, especially if they are below 25 years, it's very important to rule out that. Endometritis in presence of any intrauterine contraceptive device. Valval, any valval dermatosis, for an example, lichen sclerosis, genital wart, genital ulcer, for an example, herpes and chancroid, syphilis, lymphogranuloma venulum. Malignancy, it can be valval, vaginal, or cervical, or it can be endometrial cancer. Though uh, valva, vaginal, and endometrial cancer is the commonest cause of the postcoital bleeding, especially in the postmenopausal woman, uh, endometrial cancer, um, these are rare. Others like is any kind of trauma or any genital piercing, bleeding disorder, foreign body, sexual abuse, pregnancy related, or if any patient have any history of FGM. So when you see any postcoital bleeding patient, so when you're gonna refer them? So these are the indications for the referral to the secondary care, and you can see that if you see these things, then you have to refer urgently. That means within two weeks. That means one is if any woman presenting with the symptoms of cervical cancer, like any unexplained postcoital bleeding or any persistent vaginal discharge, you have to refer them within two weeks. 
any abnormal appearance to the cervix or the vagina on speculum examination, they also need to uh, see uh, like within two weeks. So when a patient come to you with a history of postcoital bleeding, you have to take a detailed history of that. Like you have to see the age of the patient because if they, they are in postmenopausal or perimenopausal age, you have to rule out the cervical cancer and also the endometrial cancer. If they are in young reproductive age, especially below 25 years, you have to rule out any STI over there. So the age is very important. Uh, next is that duration, frequency, and the amount of bleeding. Because if they're heavily bleeding, then you need to give them a blood transfusion. You need to take a detailed history of the menstrual bleeding. As because if this postcoital bleeding is related to intermenstrual bleeding, or heavy menstrual bleeding, you have to rule out the endometrial pathology. In the presence of other gynae symptoms, such as vaginal discharge, pelvic pain, or dyspareunia, uh, because pelvic pain, dyspareunia can be associated with uh, cervical endometriosis or PID. Vaginal discharge can be associated with any kind of STI. Or also even in case of cervical cancer, also it can be associated with that. You also need to take the contraceptive history because if any patient take any contraception or she's taking HRT or tamoxifen, they have a higher risk of cervical ectopia and even the cervical or endometrial poly for the tamoxifen. So you have to rule out that. Any history of HPV immunization, cervical screening history also very, very important when the date and the results, it's very important whether it is up to date, what the results of that. Any previous colposcopy history uh, with the treatment, that's also important. Sexual history is very, very important to rule out the STI, especially if the woman is less than 25 years. Relevant past medical and surgical history, like any bleeding disorder or whether they're taking any anticoagulant is very important. Current medication, particularly use of anticoagulant. Other relevant risk factors such as smoking status and history of domestic and sexual abuse because sometimes it can be related to that. You have to find out uh, very sensitively. So if any patient come to you with a post bleeding, so uh, I already discussed about what, are, what you're going to do, that you have to do a history taking thoroughly and you need to do an examination. So first examinations, you have to see the vulva and the vagina, any kind of erogenital atrophy, any mass, any tear over there. And then you have to look on the service by particular examination. And then you need to do a bimanual examinations to see whether there's any bulky uterus or any adjunction mass or any other over there. And then you have to take a swab. So microbiology swab, specifically if the patient is in the reproductive age group, if you see that the swab is positive, then you have to treat the infection and you have to refer the woman to the gum clinic for contract, uh, um, contact tracing. If you see the cervical screening is uh, not up to date, you can quickly do a cervical screening for her. And if it is abnormal, in that case, you have to refer her to the colposcopy. If you see the cervix is quite abnormal, it's suspicious, in that case, you can also refer her to the colposcopy. Normal cervix, but if, if you see that there's a persistent postcoital bleeding, or if it is associated with any coexisting intermenstrual bleeding, in that case, you have to consider a transvaginal scan, uh, plus minus pipels, plus minus hysteroscopy. That's depend on the individual circumstances. So these are the examinations you need to do, as a, as I mentioned. Like first, you have to uh, see the Vulva thoroughly, whether there's any kind of vulval dermatosis, excoriation, ulceration, fissuring, or any FGM or genital piercing. You need to do a casco speculation, uh, speculum to inspect the vaginal wall, whether there's any atrophy, laceration, prolapse, or ulceration lesion, whether there's any kind of vaginal discharge, whether there's any kind of foreign body over there. And also, you need to visually inspect the cervix. Uh, whether there's an ectopy or polyp. And also you need to do a bimanual examination to palpate the cervix and also the, assess the size of the uterus and also adnexia. These are the initial investigations you need to do. If the woman comes to you in a reproductive age uh, group, in that case, you have to exclude the pregnancy. This is the first thing you need to do. 
and then you need to take a swab for the chlamydia and the gonorrhea specifically for less than 25 years age if the woman is more than 25 years as you know that from 25 years uh, we will start the cervical screening then you can if it is not up to date you can do that colposcopy if a suspicious cervix tvs if the cervix is normal and if it is associated with any intermenstrual bleeding or heavy bleeding you can do that and outpatient hysteroscopy is specifically for the perimenopausal woman uh, or the postmenopausal woman if uh, the cervix looks normal and if it is associated with any intermenstrual or uh, heavy menstrual bleeding so then if you find out the cause over there according to the cause you can manage the postcoital bleeding so if you see that the cervical ectropion is quite common over there in that case you can reassure them you can tell them is a normal physiological finding usually like uh, 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 cervical eversion is because of the friable mucus secreting glandular epithelium on the endocervix when it become exposed uh, to on the ectocervix that causes this type of uh, bleeding so it's quite reassuring and on examination if you see the cervical ectropion it looks like red disc around the external cervical os and it's mainly seen after the menarche during the pregnancy or if any woman taking any oral contraceptive pill in that situation cervical remodeling in response of estrogen that cause this type of ectropion so if you see this type of ectropion it's quite uh, uh reassuring usually usually they present with any kind of increased mucopurulent vaginal discharge or and postcoital bleeding or sometimes they can be asymptomatic you can get it and as an incidental finding just reassure them you can change if they're taking oral contraceptive pill you can change them to the uh, pop that is the progesterone only pill if it is causes a uh, much more problem in that situations you can go uh, you can offer her to uh, do a electrocautery or cryocautery. For the cervical polyp, usually they are asymptomatic, and you, uh, usually we found it as an incidental. Uh, incidentally, when we do the speculum, speculum examinations uh, for the postcoital bleeding, uh, on examination we can see it can be a pedunculated, fleshy, lobular structure that can arise from the endocervical canal, ectocervix or from the endometrial poly prolapsing through the cervical canal so uh, sometimes it's quite friable and it can cause bleed on contact uh, usually we see it in the perimenopausal and the postmenopausal woman uh, in any situation if the uh, polyp is symptomatic uh, in that situations and it's associated with any abnormal cervical cytology uh, our plan is to remove the polyp and we can send it for the histopathological examination to exclude the cancer. Uh, sometimes um, this type of polyp, 55% um, cases can be associated with endometrial abnormality. So in that situations, we can do a hysteroscopy and endometrial sampling and we can remove that polyp at the same time. Risk of dysplasia and the malignancy in the cervical polyp is about uh, 0 to 1.7%, so it's quite uh, reassuring that is less likely associated with cancer uh, so if any woman is asymptomatic you can manage it conservatively you can just reassure her so uh, sometimes in especially in the reproductive age woman this type of uh, 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 postcoital bleeding uh, can be associated with any kind of infection it can be cervical infection vaginal uh, valval or endometritis or even it can be associated with pid so if uh, the woman is below 25 years age uh, in that situation chlamydial infection is quite common you can see it's uh, like seven percent as a first line treatment you can give her azithromycin one gram orally as a single dose followed by 500 milligram owns daily for two days or doxycycline 100 milligram twice a day for seven days and they should abstain intercourse until the treatment is complete and you have to refer them to the gum clinic for other uh, STI screening and also for partner notification. And for the chlamydia, usually the test of cure is not required unless any kind of compliant issues over there or she is pregnant. For the gonorrhea, uh, 
first line treatment for the gonorrhea is the ceftriaxone one gram IM uh, as a single dose. And for the gonorrhea, you need to do a test of cure so that you can confirm that uh, like it is ruled out because nowadays there's a higher chance of antibiotic resistance. So it's, it should be confirmed. Uh, so that's why you need to do a test of cure after completion of the treatment. And all the women who are positive for the gonorrhea, they also need to be referred to the gum clinic and for the further screening of the STIs, other STIs, and for also for contract testing. This is the resume of the PID. It's uh, the same for uh, all uh, occasions. Like uh, you can see that there's, it's divided into outpatient and inpatients. I think you all know about that. I'm not going to um, explain it here because it's a, there's a guideline, very nice guideline over there. So you can go through that. So this is divided into if the patient is a milder symptom, you can treat it as an outpatient. If the patient is very pain, tender, high fever, in that case, you have to admit her and then you have to give this regimen. Cervical cancer, uh, some of the cases postcoital bleeding can be associated with uh, precancerous state and also the cancer. The estimated risk is about three to 18%. And you know that this cancer is mostly associated with HPV infection. And there are some high risk HPV, one is 16 and 18, and it is associated with 70% of the cervical cancer. And the woman in their lifetime, they can get the contract of the HPV uh, in 70% of the cases. That means it's quite common, but most of the cases, this infection will clear out. But sometimes it can call, it can persist in over there and they can cause dysplasia and also invasive cancer. So nowadays, that's why um, it's uh, uh, in the UK, they programmed uh, HPV vaccine. It's a quadrivalent vaccine, name is Gardasil. It's uh, protect against the 6, 11, 16, and 18. 6 and 11 is for the uh, 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 condyloma that is... Uh, 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 condyloma and 16 and 18 is for the uh, cervical cancer and they actually targeted a uh, very young age for old girl like 12 to 13 years old girl but nowadays they uh, they also offer the boys of the same age so that they can also uh, take this uh, HPV vaccine because uh, it's, it's shown that it can also protect uh, prostatic cancer Valvo and vaginal lesion, mostly the uh, valvo vaginal atrophy is the commonest cause, specifically for the postmenopausal woman. If you see that the vagina is very dry and pale, that can indicate it's an atrophied. In that situation, you can offer them to use a vaginal moisturizer, lubricant, topical estrogen, dihydropy, androsterone, uh, osmifen, and leisure. And some of the cases, they, it can be associated with valval dermatosis, like lichen planus, lichen sclerosis, and contact dermatitis. In that situation, you have to advise them some general things like avoid soap, potential irritant. Uh, they can use a uh, regular emollient, and uh, there's a very good steroid, specifically for the lichen sclerosis and uh, lichen planus, that is the a dermovate cream, they can use that, that, that can reduce the inflammation and that can improve the skin integrity. If anytime, if you feel that is a suspicious, is a cancer, then you can take a biopsy and you can rule out that over there. In 50% of the cases, sometimes we couldn't find out the cause of the post bleeding. In that situation, you can reassure her, you can tell her that 60% of the cases the woman experienced with this type of problem that can sort out within six months automatically or spontaneously. You can just reassure them and tell them that. So that's all about this uh, guideline um, or the talk. It's, uh, it's one of the important talk I, I feel that you need to know because you can see some of the questions will come from post bleeding because nowadays these type of symptoms are quite common. So uh, if you have any query, then you can ask um, in, the, um, in the group session or even in the YouTube masses, we will be happy to answer that. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.